This is Authors Alcove, where writers learn from writers. Readers get the inside scoop and everyone learns something. An episode comes out every Wednesday where writers share their latest work. Every other Tuesday, where us writers get taught by such experts as editors, book cover artists, and marketing execs and beyond. So grab a cup of coffee and let's dive into our next book. Hi, welcome to Authors Alcove. This is Agnes Wolf. Today I have Stacy Juba, and she has written the fairy tale retellings Fooling Around with Cinderella and its sequel Prancing Around with Sleeping Beauty. Stacy, can you just share a little bit about your background on what inspired you to be a writer and then what inspired you to write such things as fairy tale retellings and chiclets? <laughs> um, so I've been writing since I was a kid. I, I wrote my first story in third grade. I loved to read and I was very introverted and writing was a way for me to express myself. So over the years, the the topics of what I was writing evolved. Like I started out writing young adult ice hockey novels and then I wrote mystery novels. And then um, most recently I kind of branched off into something I could, I could never see myself writing like a romance novel or especially a, a comedy like a romantic comedy but i think just i i found myself reading a lot of romance novels especially funny ones and chiclet and i think it was an escape for me just from you know the, the things to see in the news and i was just looking for something to read that was kind of lighthearted and funny and had a happy ending and then i went, one day i was at a fairy tale theme park with my family and we had just gone to visit Cinderella um, in the castle, and there was a long line, and she was very patient with everyone. And as we were, we were leaving, we were kind of walking down the hill. I just kind of stopped because this idea just flooded into my head of like, what if it, there was this Cinderella at a theme park that didn't want to be a Cinderella? <laughs> And she she was just a really reluctant Cinderella. And like, what if like she fell for her boss, you know, who may or may not be her Prince Charming? And yeah, you know, my husband was looking at me, he's like, You have an idea for a book, don't you? And I said, Yeah, yeah. And then I was actually in the hotel room that night. I was scribbling it um, you know, like I didn't have any paper with me, you know, they just have like the little notepad <laughs> and the pen that they give you like um at the hotel. So I was just scribbling on these tiny bits of paper, these ideas, it just kind of came at me full force. And I realized I just really wanted to write something that was fun and just had like a happy ending and that made me laugh as I was writing it. So what do you consider a chiclet? I was really inspired by like Sophie Kinsella's books where either it can be a romance in it, but it's not just about the romance. Like in a traditional romance novel, it, there's usually like alternating viewpoints. Like one chapter would be like from you know, uh, one of the romantic leads point of view. And then the second chapter would be from the other ones with, with the chiclet. It's just from that one, the woman's point of view and there can be a romance in it, but that's not necessarily the main kind of main crux of the book. It's also about her, you know, her journey. So in fooling around with Cinderella, there is a romance in it, but it's also about the Jane, the main character who, you know, she always, thought of herself kind of as a plain Jane and if she has these sisters it kind of follows this Cinderella you know fairy tale to some degree and you know it's about her journey and you know how she grows in confidence and she learns to take a stand like go after what she wants rather than always trying to please everyone else so how do you stay true to the story yet also adding your own little twist at first I did a lot of research and I didn't want to just look at the Disney version of Cinderella, I really looked back at the, you know, the history of it. And there were, there are so many, I was surprised that there was just, it started <laughs> centuries ago and there were so many different versions of it. So first I just wanted to kind of familiarize myself with that. You know, I, I like to outline. So I just, I kind of did an outline that, you know, kind of followed to, to some point, obviously she's not, she's not like a maid who's, <laughs> you know, who's sweeping floors or anything like that in her, with her evil stepsisters. So, but when she starts, she's unemployed. She lost her job. She, she was interested in marketing and public relations and um, she lost her job and she had been working for a hospital. She wanted to promote something that was fun and she was still kind of grieving the loss of her mother. 
several years ago and she just wanted to this fairy tale theme park in her in her town was a place where she had happy memories of her mom so she went and pitched herself as like that they needed to do marketing because their marketing was all kind of old-fashioned and everything and then dylan the who's like the grandson of the people who started the park he he agrees to hire her part-time for marketing but he can't give her full-time what he really needs is a cinderella because they've had a string of <laughs> failed cinderellas they called it the cinderella curse you know like there was a goth cinderella who showed up and they like in combat boots and things like that so it's kind of t- taking the aspect of the t- of the story but just kind of how can i make it funny or how can i put a twist on it like her, her sisters they're not stepsisters but they're her actual sisters but one of them is getting married and she's kind of like a bridezilla <laughs> where, where, where she's not like bad she's not like you know mean but she can be kind of pushy <laughs> and and opinionated jane has to kind of learn to stand up to her if she has another sister that's um nicer but she's like a single mom with a daughter and you know and she would just kind of relate relies on jane a lot to do babysitting and things like that so, you know again she's maybe taking advantage of her but not you know she's not not like the traditional mean cinderella stepsisters but kind of boundaries <laughs> jane needs to kind of set up boundaries so it's kind of things like that and then there is a prince charming who is the character who plays prince charming but he's not actually her prince charming <laughs> You know, <laughs> the, the romance is really between her and Dylan, who's like her her boss. So, yeah. And then there's like a fitting of the shoe at the end. kind of. <laughs> I love it. I love that you not only are retelling the story, but you also are having the actual Cinderella in the story by her having to be Cinderella. I <laughs> love that. that so it's kind of like that, like play inside a play sort of idea. <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> Does the one with Sleeping Beauty have the same sort of dynamic? It's not an actual Sleeping Beauty in it. So it, the second one, Sleep Prince Around Sleeping Beauty, is about Dylan's sister, Aurora. <laughs> you know, so first of all, like the family is, his family is very eccentric. They name all the kids after fairy tale characters. So there's like a Peter, his, his, his middle name is like Peter after Peter Pan. And they, they just have cousins, uh, you know, with different names and everything. I think there's an aunt named Gretel, <laughs> you know, like Hansel and Gretel. So it's a very eccentric family. They named her Aurora after Sleeping Beauty. She's a dancer. She, she's like a dance teacher. Roses is like one thing that's sort of like associated with Sleeping Beauty. So somehow they, her family got in, into her head that every birthday, every Christmas, they have to give her something with like a rose on it. So like her whole house and room is filled with like rose pattern you know knickknacks and pillowcases and things like that so that's how i incorporate the sleeping beauty parts of it but also she's sort of her parents sort of like princess you know she, she has two brothers and she's sort of like the princess and she wants to please her family so she kind of she's she doesn't really take a lot of risk she kind of does what's expected of her and then she meets her grandfather has this rival which is like the owner of the zoo in town their rivals that go way back and she meets the grandson <laughs> who's who works at the zoo and so that's all like where, where the romance is between he's exactly her opposite where he's just very impulsive and kind of you know opposites attract kind of thing so she, it's sort of about her journey to you know the, to being confident enough to open her own dance studio and to um you know tell her family no more roads <laughs> No more rose gifts, you know, to, to kind of just not do what's expected for her to, to kind of have the confidence to blossom and to, you know, who she wants to be. Does she happen to fall asleep? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. not, not, not literally, but I think he, I think Kyle, the, uh, the guy, you know, I think he calls her out, calls her out on it sort of like metaphorically, like you can't go through your whole life sleeping, you know, you have to. I like that. (laughs) I like that. So when you were doing research, you said that you did not just look at the stories that you had heard. You actually did research to hear the real stories. What were some of the surprising things you had heard about either Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty? There were things like, you know, I think we all have like the Cinderella. We all have like the Disney visualize her like in the blue dress. And um, it was actually, I 
did some research and I, I don't remember if it was like in a, I think it was a story. There was like a particular story that sort of the one that really took off. And before Disney, this was like the one that, that people would kind of think of when you heard Cinderella and it was, a, the dress was a different color. And, um, and that's the way I described the dress in the, the book because I wanted to kind of go more with the traditional. And a lot of people wouldn't know that because they, they're not familiar with the story from what um, it's the 1600s or 1700s or something like that. But I wanted to go more with like the traditional version. Like I wanted to stay away from like, you know, how Disney portrayed her. But I also did a lot of research just on theme parks. Like I, like whenever I saw Cinderella, like at Disney, <laughs> even though I didn't want to portray it as Disney in the book, but but I was kind of really fascinated by like the characters, you know, just working as a character, what it was like. So I was kind of like really stalking <laughs> Cinderella at Disney, like, oh my God, this year, let's follow her, you know, let's see, what she, let's see what she does or how long she stays there. Just somebody walking with her as well as that, like another fairy tale theme park we went to. And I was kind of, I look sort of like real, I was really fascinated by like the employee areas at like smaller theme parks and amusement parks I went to. I'd be kind of like looking over the fence to see, <laughs> to see what it looked like back there. And I listened to tons of like podcasts about marketing for amusement parks. And since that's what Jane's job was, I listened to interviews with like marketing directors of big theme parks. I watched YouTube videos of former Disney princesses, which is really, um, which is really fascinating just hearing their stories. So how true did you try to stay to the story and what creative license did you allow yourself to have to stray away from the actual story? I took a lot of creative license. I just, it was really just like that she lost her mother. So, she, you know, um, she did have a father he, who was, I, don't know if he, I think he was remarried. He either had a girlfriend who was married. I, can't remember. I think he was remarried. And and she was, she wasn't like an evil stepmother or anything like that. He moved to be with his like new wife and and Jane was just really missing him and just kind of taking aspects of it and then putting my own twist on it. It was like a hedgehog, the prickles. And um, I think she, she heard in the beginning, that's how she met the zookeeper because where she came out of her work and he had been doing some kind of presentation or something like with his, you know, like the kids or something like that, where he had like a hedgehog or something with it in it. And I think she got pricked or something like that. I wrote it a long time ago. I haven't read it in a while, but it was, I kind of used that to show like the pricking, you know, cause there was, you know, like the spindle and sleeping beauty. So I just kind of look for fun little ways to put in elements of it, but putting my own twist on it. Nice. I love that. That sounds so fun. Do you have any more in the series that you're working on or is it just going to be the two of them? Those are the only two I have now, but I have a bunch of ideas. I would like to do more. I'm, I'm thinking of this different characters in the book. There's like a, a girl who plays Red Riding Hood. So I'm thinking of something like wolfing around with Red Riding Hood. <laughs> I like it. Like, a, the, maybe like one with a Peter Pan theme. And I'd love to do like a Christmas one and maybe like a prequel, just like a real short story prequel leading called like the Cinderella Curse or something like that, showing how, you know, how Dylan dealt with the string of failed Cinderella's and then leading with him meeting Jane and, you know, offering her the job. So That's I had some cool. writing, I had some writing I had me to do, but. <laughs> That's very cute. So you've actually been writing for quite a while and you weren't starting with Chicklet. You actually started with mystery. What, how is writing Chicklet different than writing mystery? Yeah. Mystery. Like that. that's why I, I, you know, I never saw myself writing Chicklet because mystery just, it seemed easier to me in the sense of, of like having this, you know, just these established plot lines, like you had to have suspects, you know, there's like a murder or something. And then there's the suspects and then there's, you know, red herrings. It was sort of like this structure and it's not easier. I don't want to say that, but at the time I thought it just, for me, I was like, I thought just having this, this structure would be like easier for me. Cause then I was kind of like, well, what, you know, if, if, if you don't have a mystery, like, you know, like, what's the conflict? What are the obstacles? If you don't have the murder, it's somebody trying to kill you like <laughs> for getting too close. Like, what is your plot? But I found that writing the chiclet really came a lot more naturally to me than I would have ever anticipated. Because this, So I think it's just about writing what you're interested in and what, you know, what makes you excited. Like, when I wrote the mysteries, I was very excited to write the mysteries. I was reading a lot of mysteries. And not that I, you know, I still like mysteries, but... It's sort of that my inspiration was I, I wanted to 
I was just feeling like caught in this other direction. And, and I was like, oh, I, I'm not quite, <laughs> it, it is, the chiclet doesn't seem to have that same structure of, you know, it doesn't have like the murder. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't have like the, you know, but so I found ways of having like an antagonist. Okay, so I need an antagonist who's, who's not going to like kill anybody, but <laughs> could still cause a lot of problems for, you know, Jane or Rory. And you know, what if some of the things, you know, what are some of the obstacles that can happen? So it was just kind of trying, you know, just trying something new. And we, I read a lot of Chicklet and, and that helped. And I actually worked with an editor um, who had done a lot of Chicklet and, and that helped also just, and she had actually worked at Disney World and, <laughs> and seen a lot of behind the scenes. They're very interesting. So I met her at a parade. <laughs> it was like one of those things that was meant to be. Yeah, so it's just kind of had to learn how to write in a new genre. And I think that's something that, you know, any writer could, you, you might start out writing one kind of book and then try something different and you just kind of have to learn the mechanics and learn the rules of that genre and, you know, be open to learning and experimenting. So so you had mentioned that there was somebody that kind of inspired you with the chiclet. And, um, but overall who has been an author inspiration for you or a book even if it's just like a book that just really resonated with you what would you say is the one inspiration that you had found through a book or author the, the book that like inspired me to really write would be a write and start writing so young was the outsiders by se hinton i just loved that book growing up and i was just really inspired that she wrote it so young and i was i wanted to get a book published when i was a teenager like she did and actually ultimately i did like my i published my first book um my one of my young adult hockey novel face off when i was 18. but um as far as like the like chiclet i was i think it was reading sophie kinsella's books like confession of a shopaholic that really kind of introduced me to the genre and i was laughing out loud you know and i was like oh, I, this is just funny and i want to i want to write something that makes people laugh out loud and that's just kind of that's just fun and just really light so i think i read all uh, read all the books in her series and some she's written several others so i try to stay on top of <laughs> what she's writing because i think she's she's just she's like the chiclet queen i think <laughs> that's awesome and thank you so much for being part of authors alcove i really appreciate it. this is actually our second interview you had talked a little bit about shortcuts for writers in an earlier episode that i have on my teaching tuesdays but i asked you then and i'm going to ask you again what is one piece of advice you would give to a not yet published author and so so let's see I'll say something different than what I said last time. <laughs> but I think reading, you have to be a, a reader. You have to read a lot. And there's a lot, you'll see some writers saying like, they don't want to read in the genre they're writing because they don't want to be like influenced and everything. But I think you as an, again, I was putting on my editing hat, you know, I've had like, like science fiction sto stories be submitted to me by like writers who haven't read a lot of science fiction, you know, or, thrillers by writers who haven't read a lot of thrillers and i think you do need to read in those genres and just re read like the the best-selling name success look at the reviews and just see like what you have to know the genre you're writing and you can put your own again just like what the fairy tale are telling you put your own twist on it you're not <laughs> you're not copying anything but you do need to readers of these genres expect certain things and plot elements and tropes and things like that and i think it's important to just to put reading like as part of your um as part of your writing training thank you again thank you so much i think that is so incredibly important i can't imagine r trying to write a genre that you don't read <laughs> that would seem right. so hard <laughs> to me all right so thank you again i really appreciate it i will have links to the in the show notes to both your course because that is an awesome one make sure you check out that particular podcast as well as your books thank you again stacy Oh, thank you. This is Authors Alcove, where writers learn from writers. Readers get the inside scoop and everyone learns something. An episode comes out every Wednesday where writers share their latest work. Every other Tuesday, where us writers get taught by such experts as editors, book cover artists, and marketing execs, and beyond. So grab a cup of coffee and let's dive into our next book.
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Authors Alcove. We will be back next week on Wednesday where we will have a writer share yet another piece of work. Also, every other Tuesday, we do learn from experts such as editors, marketing execs, book cover artists, illustrators, and more. If you are interested in being a guest on our show, feel free to go to authorsalcove.com, go to the podcast tab, and then click on Be a Guest. If you're looking for a healed heart, hop on over to our sister podcast, Strength, Love, and Healing with Authors Alcove. You can find that on Spotify and the Apple Podcast. Thank you so much for listening today. Have a great day.